Welcome to Innovation Unlocked, exploring the next level of interactive entertainment, a podcast brought to you by the Interactive Entertainment Group of Perkins Coie. My name is Dave Picard, grown attorney with Perkins Coie. My practice focuses on patent litigation, including the interactive entertainment space. Today I'm joined by Dan Fiden, president of Cloud9 Esports Incorporated. Cloud9 is an American professional esports company based in Santa Monica, California. Today we're going to talk about the future of esports and how that future has been affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. So Dan, thanks for joining today. Yeah, it's no problem, Dave. So to state the obvious, the pandemic has affected everything over the past year and a half or so. But esports are sort of unique in that even before the pandemic, they were played, you know, or could be played remotely. And so there maybe was less they needed to change when the pandemic hit. But I was just curious, you know, how has the pandemic affected esports generally? Maybe the place to start is that esports, when we say esports, we're really talking about a number of different video games played professionally. So esports includes kind of League of Legends, which is, you know, probably the most popular esport in North America and, and really around the world. Games like Counter Strike, Valorant, and and each of those games is is distinct. And when it comes to the impact that COVID had on each of the sports, it varied, honestly. But generally I think esports were much more resilient than traditional sports throughout the pandemic and uh, were able to kind of navigate through the various quarantines and travel restrictions. <laughs> There's kind of the commercial aspects of esports and how they were impacted and then just the kind of core competitive aspects. I'll, I'll probably talk about the competitive aspects first. So because these are games that are played over the internet, it is, you know, technically and logistically possible for a professional game to be played with players on, you know, different in different places around the world and and in the case of some games that's absolutely what happened so we were able to across most of the games that we play continue our competitive pro seasons through the pandemic with really minor delays in the seasons to accommodate for you know, logistical changes. So in the case of League of Legends, for example, generally all of the pro pro games for the North American pro teams are played out of the Riot Games studio in Santa Monica. And so both of the teams would go to what is essentially a soundstage that accommodates a few hundred, you know, fans in attendance. Each of the teams would go and, and play on stage together. And when the quarantines hit in 2020, the decision was made to kind of pause the season for a couple of weeks and then to reorganize so that the broadcast of the games was organized kind of remotely by Riot. Their talent and, and staff kind of appeared at home in the same way that, you know, lots of the late night shows <laughs> broadcast from home um, during the pandemic. Um, and the pro players uh, played from home as well. So generally our pros will live and work together in a house or some kind of facility. And uh, Riot was able to build out a system by which the teams, you know, they were monitored to ensure there was no cheating or anything illegal happening, but they just played from, you know, where they live. And that, that continued through most of the pandemic. Even though I know they, you know, live together in the same house and all that kind of stuff, was it it seems like they're going from sort of practicing together and living together to also like competing in that same space, which I guess, you know, the, the NBA probably does all the time, right? You, you practice in your home, home stadium and then, you know, you play there as well. But was that different for like the League of Legends players to sort of, you know, play competitively where they also practice and, you know, eat breakfast and everything? Yeah, I mean, I, it's a really interesting question. I think that, you know, first of all, we, we really don't, you know, these are uniquely driven and competitive people who play play these games <laughs> at the pro level. So they, they are, I think, generally quite competitive and serious about what they do. However, I do think that there is, you hit on something that we dealt with at Cloud9. So we, we actually have a few different houses on the west side of Los Angeles. And in the case of our League of Legends kind of teams, we have a number of teams and coaches that, that play League of Legends. 
we, the coaching staff and our, our sports psychologist and the, the founder of the company, Jack, they made the decision in 2020 at, at, I don't remember exactly when this happened, but they made the decision that on game days, the players would walk down to, down the street to one of the other houses that they didn't normally play in. And they had that house set up a little bit differently with different lighting and things to try and replicate a little bit of the sense of, you know, walking up on stage, game time feeling. We won uh, the the first uh, season in 2020. So I, I don't know that I can contribute it wholly to the decision to do that, but it certainly didn't hurt us. And, and did the players seem to like that? It seems like there's probably some players who are, even they're all clearly very competitive, that are maybe more introverted and would like to just sort of huddle in and others who really want to be in front of the crowds and maybe miss the sort of live aspects of, of playing. Yeah, I mean, I, I do think it probably varies by player. I think across the board, though, all of our players and, and staff are excited to get back to playing in front of live audiences. When peak League of Legends, you know, during the World Championship, the crowds that come to see the games can be pretty massive. The 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 game in particular that I like to reference to give people a sense of the scope of what it is that that, that team does is the last... I believe it was the last world championship prior to the pandemic was held in China and it kind of tours around a few different cities in China. But the, but the finals games were held at the bird's nest, the national stadium where the Olympics were and it sold out. And that's a roughly 90,000 seat arena. Um, and so to wow. see a 90,000 seat arena <laughs> sold out with, uh, a couple of teams playing League of Legends was pretty amazing. And and have you seen with the pandemic, I mean, you know, esports have been popular around the world and they're, I think, gaining popularity in the States. Did that popularity and interest increase among sort of fans during the pandemic? You know, esports in general is massive. The viewership is massive. The but but the the viewership historically has been relatively relatively concentrated among kind of Gen Z and millennials and younger, right? So kind of the generation below me and you, Dave. And while there certainly are older folks that that watch esports, like like myself, I wouldn't say that it's you know the most common thing among our kind of generational cohort. One of the things that that I thought was really interesting to see over the course of the pandemic was when, you know, so many families were kind of locked down together, looking for things to do and, and, and looking for ways to kind of spend time together. We saw and heard about a lot of fans, a lot of kind of young, young parents and, and older parents who, you know, especially as a result of the lack of traditional sports that were that were available during yeah. during that period of time lots of dads and moms who were kind of you know saying to their sons and daughters all right teach me how this you know league of legends or overwatch or valorant thing works why do you like cloud 9 like explain to me who these players are and what is it that they're actually doing there certainly was overall an increase in viewership of of most esports and of um, platforms like Twitch, generally speaking. So that's just a platform where people stream themselves playing video games. Uh, viewership, you know, and the business overall, I think, grew as a result of the pandemic. Uh, but there was this somewhat unique generational adoption that happened that, that frankly, I, I, I don't, I don't know would have happened as quickly were, were, were it not for the circumstances that, it, that we all kind of lived through uh, last year and this year. Yeah, and, and I think some of that goes along with not just viewing esports, but, you know, people getting more involved in, of all ages in playing video games, computer games, just because it was a sort of safe social interaction that people could do during the pandemic to, you know, be able to interact with people while, you know, still social distancing from their own home and, and getting into video games generally. So I imagine that had some effect as well. Yeah, I think that the video game and I mean, you know, the the story of I think the video game industry over the last 20 25 30 years ha has been one of pretty consistent and aggressive growth and 
you know, whereas when I was a kid playing video, you know, kind of doing geeky things like playing D and D and playing video games, that was, that was not common, right? That was not necessarily something that was part of core pop culture. I would say that from, for millennials and younger, They've grown up with video game consoles in their house and whether they kind of self-identify as gamers or not, it is, I think, the, the, the most common pop art for that generation and younger. Uh, it's really the way that they interact with one another. And, and since kind of multiplayer video games have become more and more popular kind of following the, you know, early 2000s when internet you know, internet speeds and proliferation was kind of wide enough that people could, you know, actually play games together from home. I think that video games as a platform for socializing and finding friends and meeting friends and doing things together has become more and more common. But it really, you know, there are a few stories of games over the course of the pandemic that really took off as ways to, you know, socialize. In the same way that Zoom, I don't, I don't know that anyone probably who worked at Zoom ever imagined that there'd be like Zoom cocktail parties that were happening, <laughs> but it now seems like that's, you know, kind of a, a fundamental part of uh, how people use the platform. One thing that's interesting, you mentioned Twitch, and we've talked about this a little bit before, is, you know, the, the community of fans of esports is much more interactive with the with the players than in in traditional sports and i was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that i <laughs> not being a professional traditional athlete i don't know that i could <laughs> fully say exactly what it's like for them but i do think that there is a dynamic that has evolved around video game streaming and esports that's pretty unique you know, essentially what happens with our, our pro players or most of our pro players is, you know, they have a, this may be surprising to some people, but it's, you know, uh, uh, kind of the, just the par part of the job at, at this point for us. But, you know, our p pro players have a day that looks in many ways like any other traditional athlete, right? They uh, wake up at nine and meet with um, the physical trainer, the team gets together with the physical, physical trainer and they do, you know, about an hour workout together. And then after that, um, somebody makes some breakfast, they eat breakfast and they start their first meeting of the day uh, to talk about what they're going to do in practice over the course of the day. And so the coaching staff will sit with them, our sports psychologist, who's like I named Dr. Gary Hoyt, who, um, was the uh, performance psychologist for Naval Special Warfare before he joined Cloud9. So he's kind of like an interesting career shift. But like he'll, Gary will meet with them, the coaches, the analysts, our data, our data analytics team, performance analytics team. And they'll all just kind of talk about what they're going to focus on over the course of practice in the day. And then they'll practice, you know, with breaks for lunch and things like that for, you know, eight hours or so until, you know, six or seven o'clock in the evening. At that point, you know, the, the, their time is their own, right? And many of them will log on to Twitch and play the game that they, that they, you know, is also their vocation and they'll stream that to their fans. And, and while they're streaming and playing, they'll interact with their fans and answer questions, uh, respond to things that they're saying in chat. And the way that I kind of think about that is, it, it, again, for somebody who's a little bit older, like, like me, you know, when I was growing up, I grew up in Buffalo, New York, and like everyone was a big Bills fan. And so, like, people would, you know, watch the Bills on Sunday. And then every night during the week, they'd turn into these AM talk radio shows where, you know, everyone would kind of like have their theory about what should be happening with the Bills. And then there'd just be these hosts, right? Like this classic sports talk radio host. In some ways, this is like, a pro player like Jim Kelly from that area of the Buffalo Bills, like after practice get going and like kind of throwing a ball around in his front yard while answering questions on camera from fans. And the questions are like, what did you guys focus on in practice? You guys got stomped last weekend. What did you do wrong? Why did you ever, you know, do this? Why did you decide to run on third and, and 15 or whatever it is? which is a very interesting and quite intimate dynamic. I think that there is a relationship as a result of that that's built between fans and the pros that is no less, um, no less admiring, no, no less um, aspirational, but is somewhat more 
personal, if that makes sense. There really is no kind of wall between uh, our, our our players and and their fans. Their interaction is really familial and and pretty intimate, which I I think is really cool. And I think that that's just a characteristic of shifts in media and kind of what celebrity means today more generally, right? I think that the relationship that like uh, at risk of like getting nasty email sent to me or something like the, the, I think one of the really cool innovations about somebody who like, you know, Kim Kardashian or something who's like primarily a social media kind of celebrity is that they've built that relationship very directly. There isn't really very much standing in between them and, and their fans, the, the, the platforms on which their primary kind of relationship is managed are, are, are quite intimate in a way that Tom, <laughs> you know, Tom Cruise, you kind of like, if you thought Tom Cruise was, well, you go and see him in a movie and then, you know, and there was never really any, right. Like direct way to interact prior, prior to social media. And so I think people who generated their celebrity, in that way somehow have maintained that mode of interacting with their fans. Whereas like people who really kind of developed their relationship with their fan base on these more intimate platforms, I think just have a very different type of relationship with, with the people that they're interacting with. Have you seen either traditional sports teams or traditional sport, like younger traditional sports players capitalize on that or sort of have that sort of interaction in a way that that uh, is is more like you see with esports players yeah i think that uh, you know i think that th there is a higher level kind of business question around esports which is kind of why is this an interesting thing maybe <laughs> to put it really simply <laughs> And I think that the fact that our players play video games is not the most interesting thing about it. That is in some ways expected given that for the past 20 years, kind of the prime, if you just look at the number of hours people spend competing with one another in a game, any kind of game, I don't have this data, it would be much more powerful <laughs> if I had this data at my fingertips. but I speculate I, and, I, and I have a high degree of confidence to be right. If we, if we were able to aggregate that data, the majority of hours that humans spend competing with one another in a game format would be in video games rather than traditional sports. Now, I just think there's more hours spent doing that than there are across all people, right? Not, sure. not just some, some smaller subset. Or to say it a different way, I bet there's a lot more hours played of League of Legends than there are of basketball right now. I don't know that that's true, but I suspect that that's true. Okay, so if that is true, then the fact that there are professionals that do this is, is novel, but not it shouldn't be unexpected. What I think is more interesting is that esports has cracked a content and a fan interaction code that traditional sports needs to crack in order for them to solve what is a across most sports demographic challenge they have, right? If you look at kind of the average age of the major league baseball fan, it is a, uh, it's in the upper fifties and a core part of their fan base is baby boom boomers, which is a very large generational cohort. And, and, <laughs> And at risk of being very morbid, and one that you know is is declining, right? It is not, you know, after after a few years, a generation stops getting bigger, and it just continues to get smaller, and that's the way generations work. And baby boomers are kind of at that that point, but but for a long time, they were, they're such a big generational cohort that they had an outsized impact on businesses and culture, right? And I think in many ways, traditional sports like baseball have really optimized their businesses around the behaviors and, and kind of preferences of baby boomers. But that, generate, that, that customer base is declining and declining relatively rapidly. Gen X, which is my generation, is also not getting, getting any bigger and we're declining at an increasing rate. But we've just never been a large enough generational cohort, I would argue, to really sustain or move the culture, sustain industries or move the culture. We're just too small a percentage of the population. Millennials are massive and now bigger than 
baby boomers. But there is this stark break, I think, in what their preferences are, their kind of content media preferences. And and esports, I think, is in some ways the first kind of collection of sports that have figured out how to engage and talk to those fans and monetize those fans. And so as baseball and hockey and football try to address their demographic challenges by appealing to millennials, it isn't just a question of like making a cooler commercial to run on an AM talk radio station, right? Like that's <laughs> like the, 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 the shift is way bigger than that. The, they, they need to change the way players interact with fans. They need to change the kind of stories they tell the platforms they tell them. And I think the, the, some of the most thoughtful sports businesses have already, you know, invested pretty heavily in esports perhaps because it is a good investment and a good business in and of itself but i would argue also because they 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 need to understand how to adopt some of those practices to their more traditional business so you know we compete in the league of legends league with a team called the golden guardians which is owned by the golden state warriors so you, you talked about the generational shift and you talked a little bit about sort of recruiting and all that kind of stuff. And and one thing I think that you guys are doing that's really interesting is the whole idea of the training grounds, which is sort of like little league for for esports. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what's going on with that. Yeah. It, so again, it, it's a it's this kind of interesting for us has been an interesting, a really really interesting and, and engaging project to work on. But but it started with a little bit of a thought experiment, which is if you think about baseball, there is this amazing legacy infrastructure of youth and amateur leagues and coaches and facilities, right? Every middle school that gets built in every school district around the country has a baseball diamond behind it. No one really questions like whether that's needed or not. We're just kind of somehow over this cultural hump on on believing that that's like a good thing for 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 people to engage in or that's a worthwhile investment. But but this this infrastructure goes back, you know, over 100 years, right? If there were a sport that were invented two years ago or five years ago, how would all of this shake out, right? It's a very different, you know, we live in a global media environment rather than a very localized one, which is, you know, when baseball became popular, right? So there are lots of things that kind of flow out of that. And so what we thought about is how would we build out a youth and amateur infrastructure for for esports? We believe that it would be built you know, the experience that many people have with video games today is that the first time they really see them played and played well is by Cloud9 playing against some other team in a global, you know, on a global media platform like Twitch. And they look at the game and they hear the commentators and they see the pro players talking about it and playing the game. And they say, oh, that's a pretty cool game. I want to go, I want to go get more serious about that game. And then they say, hey, mom and dad, <laughs> like, how do I do that? And the answer really has been mostly there is no way for kids to play these games in an organized way with a coach. And so we felt like given that global media environment and the fact that the pro teams in many cases are the first teams really, you know, introducing these games to players, we felt like it was, you know, Cloud9 had an opportunity to really build this out and deliver on what we think is a core aspirational experience for kids who play youth sports, which is, you know, I sign up for baseball and I can't wait for that first day when I find out what team I'm on and I get my jersey, right? And I kind of hope I get the cool jersey, you know, and and when you're a kid, you kind of hope you want to get a Yankees jersey. You don't want to get like a mud hens jersey, not picking on the mud hens or anything, but you know, it's core to like that aspirational sense that you have when you're a kid. So we wanted to deliver on that. And, and then the question is like, why did we want to do that at all? Why not just focus on pro stuff? When we look at like, um, we looked at basic questions, like when a pro comes to us, it is the equivalent of somebody getting signed to the Lakers, only having shot baskets in their driveway alone. And then they show up and all of a sudden they're getting paid, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars, sometimes millions of dollars a year to play this game. But they frequently have never been in the same room as a teammate. They've never had a coach, right? And and that's a somewhat strange experience. And so, you know, whereas in... Tri- 
you know, in video games, the, the, all the data on kind of like who is mechanically good or whose data suggests they're good, that's a solved problem. We can kind of see that for anybody playing in the whole world. But what we can't see is who's a good teammate, who's a good communicator, who's resilient, who's coachable. All of the, I think, skills that, that I think generally speaking we think are good to learn by having our children participate in, in youth sports there was just no infrastructure to really find that out. And so we felt like, okay, that's an opportunity for us that will over time, over a long period of time, result in better pro players who have better soft skills because they'll have been through those experiences. But for us, it wasn't, you know, when we kind of like came to that conclusion, it wasn't just like, oh, we just, we, we want better pros. This is some kind of competitive edge. I think we realized pretty quickly, well, gosh, you know, maybe kids who are spending a lot of time competing with one another in online video games and, and frequently having teammates and opponents that are kind of anonymous on the internet, maybe you're learning a lot of bad stuff. You know, maybe you're learning like, you know, the the wrong ways to communicate and like, you know, bad traits about how to, how to um, deal with losses and game. And, and, and so we felt like if we could create something that taught those lessons that we feel like pros benefit from, it probably will benefit any kid and the vast majority of kids will not be pros, you know? And, and, and so I guess the, the basic idea here is just because you happen to like league of legends better than basketball doesn't mean that you should be robbed of the opportunity to learn those kinds of life skills that we think benefit people kind of regardless of what they go on to do. Yeah, it totally makes sense. I think that, it's great to have a way for kids, you know, kids of, you know, sort of all ages, but, you know, especially like, you know, kids and teenagers to be able to learn teamwork and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, uh, my wife always talks about how, you know, the value of, you know, being on a team sport and that kind of thing. And, you know, and there's some kids who want to do team sports, but, you know, don't want to be on the basketball team or the football team. And, and there's a lot of parents who may, maybe don't want them to be on the football team either. So it's a, it's a way for them to get those skills. And, and you're right. Cause you know, if you just sort of go unsupervised into some of these games, they, they can be a little toxic with, with some of the, you know, maybe not League of Legends as much, but you know, some of these other games uh, can, you know, the, the fan base can be a little toxic if you're not sort of prepared for that and, and having a little more structure is, is a very cool idea. Yeah. And I mean, we, you know, we, we deal with it at the pro level and, and we know that it's true at all levels, you know, the, the, the things that we all kind of can put on the bumper sticker for why we think youth sports is a good idea. They really are. It's real. It's, you know, being resilient is important in life. But it really is important if you want to be good over time at one of these games, even if you can just kind of ignore all the other, it actually is something you need to have in order to be good, you know, tilting after you lose um, is not going to help you in that next game that you're queued up for. And, and, and so we spend a lot of time thinking about it. And it's actually one of these areas that our, our performance psychologist, Gary, spends a lot of time with our players on right how to and it's something that he he kind of has talked to me about in the past that that you know he 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 would work with the seals on is how to kind of recognize the physiological signs of stress and and what amounts to tilt right mm-hmm. and how to kind of recenter deal with them physiologically so that you can you know go about doing whatever it is that you're going to do, regardless of how high stress it is without being kind of negatively impacted by those kind of mental states. So one last area to talk about, which is, so you you mentioned that the players are looking forward to getting back to live events. And in the legal field, obviously there've been a lot of changes of the pandemic and there's some things that maybe are going to stay changes, even if we, if, if and when we get back to something that's a little bit more normal. So, you know, remote depositions is something that I think are, are here to stay, for example. Are, are there things in esports that you think are, you know, spurred by the pandemic, but maybe will continue beyond the pandemic? Yeah, I hope so. I think that I'm, I'm not, you know, I, I definitely hope that we return to live events, but I think in some cases, esports, because it's such a new industry, 
and and it's really a collection of startups trying to figure out really how to kind of take advantage of the maybe cultural tailwinds that that exist around it it's natural to kind of look for analogs right and i think a lot of what many esports businesses have done is really modeled what they do on traditional sports so the way that we sell advertising or sponsorships frequently looks quite similar to what traditional sports teams do if you go to certain live events esports live events they look a lot like a traditional sports event actually and if you look at how certain leagues are organized, I think they're heavily influenced by what traditional sports do. And I think that that, or, or even looking at broadcast, I think broadcast is a really, really good example. Because we are online, because like the playing field is, is virtual for most of these games, I think there are opportunities for us to innovate much more deeply. And instead of trying to kind of mimic a, a business that we know works, uh, think a little bit more about what doesn't work about those businesses and then leverage our, our differences to really solve those problems. You know, one example. I, I don't want to say that I think that this is a hundred percent like going to change, but you know there there have been there have been there that that we're, we participate in one league uh, called the Overwatch League, and the and the teams have these kind of geolocated. They're they're geolocated in the way that traditional sports are. So our team is called the London Spitfire, and it's like our home market is London. It's an interesting idea. It's an interesting analog. I think it has some real advantages. It can kind of generate, it can, it can really help you. Uh, it's a shorthand to generating a passionate fan base. But I also think it is in many ways an artifact of, you know, a, a pre-global media environment where if you wanted to go see a baseball game, you kind of had to walk to the ballpark. You know, the team that you saw was the local team because... You know what I mean? You couldn't go walk to the ballpark in London if you lived in Brooklyn, you know? And 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 then, you know, a more regional media environment evolved to kind of cover, you know, competitive play. And then and then things got more global as kind of the media environment, I think, supported it. Esports started out in a totally global, you know, with no with no meaningful physical constraint and no meaningful media kind of coverage constraint. So why should we not leverage a global audience for all of our teams? You know, it's, it's a, it's a, it introduces some challenges for esports teams. Like how do you, you know, how do you define your brand if it isn't defined by like some city, you know, how do you differentiate one team from the other? But I think that's a cool challenge. It's an interesting challenge. Well, Dan, thanks again for your time. And Best of luck to Cloud9 and to you as we hopefully get past uh, the pandemic and we can stop talking about it all the time. Yeah, you too, Dave. Thanks.